great to be back after Thanksgiving. I know you've had a, had a feast. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. And uh, it's just a wonderful day to be here in the house of the Lord to worship Him. He is our Savior. We're here. We're here to the Christmas season. Now Thanksgiving has passed. We've got some Christmas decorations in here. I want to encourage you to be a part of what's going to be happening here at the church all throughout uh, the Christmas season. Uh, starting next week, I'm going to begin a, a, a few uh, sermons uh, that are going to be entitled The Unexpected Christmas. And there are going to be some, some sermons that uh, I think are going to be an encouragement to you and maybe some things that you've never thought about in regards to the Christmas story. So that's going to be, that's going to be a good time for us. Uh, also, we'll be having a Christmas Eve. A candlelight service will give you more details on that uh, as that gets near and we know exactly what time that's going to be. Also, we're going to have a time for our uh, youth and if our kids want to go with their parents as well, a time of caroling on uh, December the 11th. That's a Saturday, December 11th. And anybody who wants to come, you're welcome to come. And we're going to meet here at 5 o'clock. We're going to go to some of the homes of some of our more homebound members and sing some good caroling songs. And so come do that. Listen, if there is somebody um, that you, and I can't promise you we can get to everybody, we'll, we'll just have to see. We might have to do it a couple times. But if, if there's somebody that you're, you want us to go um, carol at their home, their homebound, uh, let us know. Let me know. Um, let Justin raise your hand. Let Justin know. Let me know. And we'll, we'll try to get that done. So we're excited about that opportunity. That's December 11th, okay, at 5 o'clock. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we give the end of this service. Heavenly Father, you've been so good to us this week. And God, you have seen to it that you have protected us. Lord, I lift up uh, my brothers and sisters in here that have dealt with uh, difficulty over Thanksgiving. And, Lord, you have shown once again your faithfulness to protect and to be with in every situation. Lord, as we gather, we know today that you love us, that you care for us, and that you're with us. And, Father... While there are so many things that have taken our time this last week, we pray that this next hour would be an uplifting time for us, an edifying time for us. Most importantly, God, that it would honor and glorify you as we sing songs of praise and as we turn our attention upon your word. Touch us, heal us. Meet with us. We pray this today in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. David, watch all come and lead us. Would you stand your feet as we sing this morning? Bye. 
just in, placed it on my heart as we were singing for us to just take a moment and have a time of corporate prayer together. Um, I'm just going to invite you here in a moment for us all to just begin to start praying. I don't know what's going on in everyone's life, but I just, uh, I, I don't know, I just sense today in my spirit that um, there, there seems to be um, something going on. And uh, when we come here into the house of the Lord, uh, we need to get our hearts ready and be prepared to worship. <clears throat> this isn't just any day. This is the Lord's day. Listen, this is the day that we come Sunday morning to worship the Savior who after he went to the cross and died, was buried on the third day, he rose again on that Sunday morning. We worship the resurrected Jesus. So maybe there's sin in your life you need to confess. Maybe there's a problem right now that's just got your mind blocked up. An issue in your family, an issue in your life. Whatever it is, I want us to bow our heads right now, and I'm going to give you a moment to start praying. Maybe it's just a friend or a family member you need to pray for. Whatever it is, I want you to start praying. Perhaps we're just distracted today because of all the festivities of the last week. Or we're tired because we stayed up too late. Let's not allow this morning to pass without meeting with God. Father, the only thing I know today, God, is that we need you. We desperately need you. We need your spirit here to move in power. God, forgive us for our sin and prepare us to meet with you right now today. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward at this time. I need all of our ushers to come. We got several men out today. You're, somebody get the offering plates in the back. We're going to take up our offering. As we prepare to take up the offering, I want you to know, uh, notice we we're above, we're, we're at $134,000 given to our Forward by Faith initiative. So we praise God for that. Thank you for your faithfulness in that. Also, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering begins. So if you would like to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, that goes to support all of our international missionaries through the IMB. I'm going to give you some stats and some things about that next week. I'm excited about that. Well, we're going to take up our offering, and I'm going to ask Brother Ron Shannon to lead us in a prayer for our offering today. Father, we come to you today thanking you for your goodness to us here, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for the church and for so many things to be grateful for. Father, just be with each and every one here today. Just bless this offering to the youth and youth. Would you continue worship with us this morning? Yeah. 
would turn with me in your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. After this morning, we're going to move into just a Christmas series. And after we finish that, we'll come back and pick back up here in the Gospel of John. But what I want to do is I want to share with you today, out of John 15, starting in verse 12, about serving the King. Serving the King. If you've ever heard this statement before, you've heard people in or around the White House say, I serve at the pleasure of the president. I serve at the pleasure of the president. The people that say that are those that the president appoints as his staff of aides, advisors, assistants. These are political appointments, and so... They're not subject to review by the Senate. Basically, the president brings them on, and he can take them off anytime he wants. And essentially, uh, they're just there to support the president, uh, probably agree with the president on most things. They don't have a vote. They don't have a say in anything. Uh, they might talk a little bit, but the president does what the president wants to do in those situations. But they're there. And they're really like an inner circle of people. These members of the president's court, if you will, they're like an inner circle. They're, in, in one sense, you could think of them as friends. Friends and confidants. Uh, people that um, the president can, can just speak to and speak openly to. And so that's why they say we serve or I serve at the pleasure of the president. And if it's not the pleasure of the president anymore, then they stop serving because he tells them to take, to take a hike. But normally, they're viewed as an inner circle, even friendly with the president. Well, I want to tell you today that there is someone much higher and much greater than any president this nation will ever know. Much higher and much greater than any king this world has ever seen or will ever know. In fact, the Bible says that this person is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to this earth, and he lived a sinless, perfect life. He came from heaven, was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life, and he went to the cross to die there for our sins. And he paid the full price for our sin. He was buried in a grave. And on the third day, he rose victoriously over sin. He is the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. He's the master of all things. Everything uh, knows Jesus as king is, and Lord. Even death itself submits to Jesus. Okay? He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, now here's something I want to bring you in on. This great and mighty king, this lord and sovereign of the universe, he invites you into his court. He invites you into his inner circle. He invites you to be his friend. He invites you into a place where you can say, I serve at the pleasure of the king. Now, isn't it wonderful to know that you can have such calling and such purpose in your life? I'm here to tell you today, friend, you absolutely do and you absolutely can if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And here in John chapter 15, Jesus is teaching his disciples that he has called out of this world and appointed them to service. He is saying, I have called you, I've commanded you, I have commissioned you to serve me. And he says, but you don't just serve me as anyone, you serve me as a friend. He says, you serve me as a friend. See, we have a friend in Jesus. Now, don't get it wrong today. Jesus is our master, but he's also our friend. He's also our friend. If you've turned to John chapter 15, I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able. If you're not able, I understand that, but if you're able, stand in the, on, the honor of the reading of God's word, starting in verse 12. I'm going to read all the way through verse 26. 
The words are on the screen. The scripture's on the screen for you also. But it's, the word of God reads, this is my command in verse 12. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give you. This is what I command you. Love one another. If the world hates you, understand that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of this of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But they will do all these things to you on account of my name. Because they don't know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now they have no excuse for their sin. The one who hates me also hates my father. If I had not done the works among them that no one else has done, they would not be guilty of sin. Now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But this happened so that the statement written in their law might be fulfilled. They hated me for no reason. Verse 26. When the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify about me. You also will testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Father, we ask you to honor the reading of your word. We ask that you would bless it and use it in our lives. We submit to you, Holy Spirit, right now. Do a work in us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. Today, we talk about serving at the pleasure of the king. I want you to first know that I serve, or you serve, or you can serve because the king loves you. You see that today? The king loves you. It says here in verse 12, the very first verse we read, Jesus says, this is my command, love one another. But let's not miss what Jesus says at the end of that. As I have loved you. Here's a faithful and true statement today. Jesus loves you. The creator of the universe. The one that holds everything that exists in his hand. The one that hung the stars and the moon. That keeps this world from crumbling. The one that knows every hair on your head and every thought in your mind. The sovereign of the universe. God Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, He loves you. Amen. You know what I can't say about a single president in this United States? Not one of them ever loved Brady Wood. Not one of them ever loved you personally. Now, if you've met one and they told you that, come and tell me after the service. I'd like to know about it. The king says, I love you. I care for you. Jesus says, he says here in verse 13, no one has greater love than this. To lay down his life for his friends. Can I tell you something today? As much love as you experience in this life from friends and family and spouses and parents, 
You've never experienced love greater than the love of Jesus. There is no greater love than the love of Jesus. Jesus says there is no greater love than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Let me tell you today what Jesus has done for you. Because he loves you, Jesus laid down his life for you. What the Bible means when it says, Jesus says, lay down his life, Jesus means he laid down his life on the cross for you. 2,000 years ago, the most important moment in time in history itself took place. The King of Glory, God become flesh, was led up a hill called Mount Calvary. And Mount Calvary was the place, the hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull, was the place that criminals were crucified by the Roman government. Yet Jesus was without sin. He had no reason in himself in which to be crucified. But he took your sin. He took my sin. He took the sin of the world upon himself. And Jesus, we, we, he said earlier in John, he said, no one takes my life from me. I give my life. He said, and if I give my life, I'll raise my life back up. You see, it didn't matter how much the Romans or the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. They couldn't do it. Jesus gave himself. He laid his own life down. The wooden tree was there on the ground on top of the hill. And Jesus laid his own body down. They had never seen someone crucified that didn't fight against those that were going to be the crucifiers. And Jesus didn't fight against them. He laid his life down upon that tree. He stretched his arms out. They didn't have to hold him and force him down. He said, go ahead and do what you're going to do. And they nailed him to the tree. And they lifted him up. And there he hung beside the criminals. And there Jesus bled and he died. He laid down his life. He shed his blood in your place for your sin so that you could be forgiven and have a relationship with him. The king died on the cross for you so that you could be his friend. And so that you could serve at the pleasure of the king, your friend. Romans 5, 8, guys, you put that on the screen for us, says God proves his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for me. In our world, we surround ourselves with people that have done something good for us. Okay? We surround ourselves with people that are going to help us. We didn't bring anything to the table for Jesus. We didn't offer him anything. We're sinners. We're at odds with God. We're at war with him. Why did Jesus go to the cross and die for us? Right there it is. Because God was proving his own love toward that's how much God loves you. That's how much Jesus loves you. So let me just say this today. I serve, you serve, or you can serve at the pleasure of the king, your friend, because he loves you. He loves you. Let me tell you another reason why. You can serve at the pleasure of the king, your friend, because he commands you. He commands you. He commands me to serve. Look what he said in verse 12. He said, this is my command. Love one another. How is it that Jesus wants you to serve him? Oh, it's real simple. It can be summed up in this word right here. Love one another. Love one another. He says, this is my command. In fact, you can go and you can look at verse 17. He says it again. This is my, this is what I command you. Love one another another. You love one another as I love you. Jesus commands us 
to love. He commands us to serve him. Matthew chapter 22. Guys, put that on the screen for me. Matthew chapter 22, starting verse 37. Jesus said to him, the guy, this guy asked, what, what's, what's the greatest command? What should I really focus in on? Here's what Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The chief command is what? Love the Lord your God. We talked about it a few weeks ago. We can love God because God has first loved us. While we were yet sinners, God was still loving us and he sent his son to die on the cross for us. God has proven, he's demonstrated his own love. He said, this is what you should do. Love the Lord your God with all of who you are, your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. This is that most important command. He says the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here's what Jesus says. You love God and you love others. You love God and you love your neighbor. You say, well, who's your neighbor? Your neighbor is everybody, okay? Yes, you have neighbors in your neighborhood, okay? You need to think of your neighbor as your fellow human beings, humankind, mankind all around you. The person you see at Starbucks when you go get your Christmas latte this week. Pumpkin spice is gone. All right, we've moved off of that. When you go into Panera and get your salad, the person serving you, that's your neighbor. Okay? When you go to the restaurant today, you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm checking. It's about time. Let's hurry this thing up. You get hungry. When you go to the restaurant today, the people you interact with, the tables around you, okay, the waitress or waiter, that's your neighbor. Okay? Others, all these others, that is your neighbor. Jesus says, here's what you're going to do. Love God and love others. Love your neighbor. Love them as yourself. And, and I don't know, other than, other than God, I, who loves you more than you love yourself? Right? <laughs> That's right. You love yourself. I know you do. God says, love your neighbor as yourself. Look at verse 40. All the law and prophets depend on these two commands. He said, Jesus, let me make it real simple for you. Rather than just stressing out about everything, do these things. He said, let me make it real simple for you. You love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love other people. <clears throat> I serve. You serve. You can serve the king. And the king is or he can be your friend because he commands us to. He commands us to. He says, I command you, love one another. Love others. Love God and love others. Now, there's something else. There's something else here. Not only does Jesus, the king, love you, not only does he command you to serve him, but he also has commissioned you. He's commissioned you. I want you to notice this. Verse 15, he says, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. Jesus says, I have, I have made you my friend. I've brought you into my family. Verse 16, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain. I mean, do you realize Jesus had 12 disciples? Now, he's talking here to his 11 because Judas is off bringing the authorities to arrest Jesus at this moment. Okay, if you're just now joining us, right here in chapter 15, Jesus is heading to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's hours away from being arrested and hours away from hanging upon the cross. 
Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, is off getting the authorities as we're studying this. Now, you realize what Jesus did? He chose these 12, he chose these 11 disciples. Here they are, some of them, they're out fishing. And they're out there catching fish. And Jesus says, you come on, you follow me. He chose them and said, I've got something for you. I've got something for you to do. He says, no longer are you going to catch fish, you're going to be catching men. He's talking about winning them to Jesus, winning them to salvation. Oh, Matthew, he's a, he's a tax collector. Nobody likes him. That old Weasley guy, he had no purpose in his life other than maybe lining his pockets by taking from his own, his own people. Jesus found him one day out by that tax booth and he said, Matthew, I got something else for you. I'm choosing you today to be one of my disciples. I want you to come follow me. I've got some plans for you. I'm appointing you to something. I'm commissioning you to something. Let me tell you today, church, Jesus has commissioned you. He has appointed you. He has ordained you. You. you say, what does that mean? Here's simply what it means. That word appointed, order, ordained, here's what it means. To assign someone to a particular task. That's literally what it means. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, I have chosen you to do something for me. I have chosen you. I have appointed you to fulfill a specific task. And what is it that he has chosen us to do? To serve the king. That's what it is. To serve him as a friend. And there's something really specific that we're going to get to that he has commissioned us to. We are to serve at his pleasure. Understand something today. You don't tell Jesus what you want to do. Now, you, you can talk to him. Don't, don't get me wrong. I want you to pray, and I want you to be open with the Lord. Tell him your heart. He, he loves it when you come to him. You bring whatever you want to with him. You can tell him what you want to do. Okay? You can tell him. Tell him what you want to do. But when he comes down to it, you're going to need to do what he tells you to do. Okay? Sometimes he tells you to do what it is you want to do. But if he tells you to do something that you didn't think you wanted to do, can, can you just take my word on this? It's better than what you're thinking. It's better than what you would have come up with. It's better than what you really wanted. Be careful about doing things that you want to do that don't match up with what God wants you to do. Because when you start doing things that you want to do that God doesn't want you to do, you're going to find yourself in a heap of trouble. You do what God wants you to do, and you're going to find yourself living a life that has joy, peace, comfort, excitement. You're going to be exhilarated, and you're going to have a great, great purpose in your life. And so he has commissioned you to a specific task, to serve at his pleasure, to do what he has called you to do. There's two things I want to share with you really quickly that he has called you to do. Every single one of us in this room. The first one. We're not doing a very good job of. The first one we're not doing a very good job of. The first one may be the reason we see the nation in the shape it is in. I believe it probably is. And it goes to the commission itself. In Matthew chapter 28, here's what Jesus says. He says, this is what I want you to do, my disciples. He says, all authority. He has come out of the grave and all authority has been placed into his hands by the Father. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
You can write it down. You need to memorize it. And you need to know it. There is one thing for sure Jesus has commanded and he has commissioned for you and for me to do. It's not just the preacher's job. It's not just the deacon's job. It's just not the Sunday school teacher's job. It is the Christian's job. If you have been saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have a mission to take that gospel to everybody else you know. When the gospel changes people's life, it changes everything. You want to see the community changed? Start winning people to Jesus. Because Jesus changes people. You want to see policies changed? You start winning people to Jesus. The people that are saved, they're going to govern and they're going to act in a certain way. Because they have Jesus in their life. You want to see your family changed? Win them to Jesus. And the gospel transforms a person's life. Jesus has commissioned us, the great commission, go and make disciples. Win them to me. Serve at his pleasure. There's something else, and we see it here in this chapter 15. What's he say? He says, share, share his love. Share his love. He's commissioned us to share his message, and he's commissioned us to share his love. He says, you love one another as I have loved you. The love you've received from Christ, you share that love with those around you. If you share the love of Christ with those around you, and then you share the message of the gospel with them, it's going to make an impact on somebody's life. I want you to see what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Guys, put that on the screen. It says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. That is the gospel message. You say it. I don't know how to tell somebody how to be saved. I don't know how to share the gospel with somebody. Here's what my evangelism professor said, taught us. He said, if you know enough of the gospel to be saved by it, you know enough of the gospel to share it with somebody else. And if you don't know enough of the gospel to share it with somebody else, you may not know enough of the gospel to be saved by it. If you can't articulate the gospel message to someone else, how do you know the gospel yourself? There, it's simple. And what's Paul say? He says, I delivered unto you that which is of first importance. That's the most important thing right there. The most important thing. The gospel. That Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross. Was buried. And he was raised on the third day to set us free from sin. And anybody that believes in him would be saved. I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you today to take seriously sharing that message with people. We have for so long talked about, for so long we've talked about if we, just, if we just live a good life, that's what's going to make the difference. Listen, living a good life, it does help. It does help. I've never once in all of my life had somebody come up to me and say, you know, last night I prayed and asked Jesus to be my Savior because I just saw so-and-so has been living a good life. Because so-and-so goes to church every Sunday and I'm their neighbor and every day I've watched them back out of their garage and go to church. I've never once had somebody come up and say to me, I, I prayed and received Jesus today because I just kept on seeing that person driving to church every day. Every time somebody has told me they've been saved, somebody has shared with them the gospel message. They have told them, this is how you can be saved. 
would you trust Jesus? Living a Christian life is important. Because if you're not living a good Christian life and not walking with God, then your message is going to fall on deaf ears. But we got to do both. We got to live the right way, but we must never neglect giving the message. Love others, love one another, and share his message. Finally, I have one more thing I want to share with you. We can serve at the pleasure of the king, who is our friend, because he equips us. In fact, he sets his seal on us. In verses 18 through 25, Jesus says essentially this. If you follow me, and if you live for me, if you're a Christian, you will be persecuted. Don't be surprised when you are persecuted. Don't be surprised. Now this is going to sound heavy and harsh. This is the words of Jesus. Don't be surprised that other people hate you. Okay? What do you do about people that hate you? Well, you don't hate them back. You love them. That's what you do. What Jesus says, love one another. But he says, don't be surprised that the world hates you. Because you're not of the world. I have called you out of this world and into my family. I've called you out of the world and into service for me. But he says, don't be sorry. He says, the world hates me. The world's going to hate you. A servant is not greater than his master. And if our master was crucified, if our master was hated, if our master was persecuted, we should expect we too are going to be persecuted. We too are going to suffer. We too are going to be hated by this world. And you know this as well as I know this. The world hates the church of the living God. It just does. It's not going to change, friends. The world's going to hate the church. The world is going to hate you if you stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he says this, it's okay. Why? Because I'm setting my seal on you. I am equipping you to endure all things and persevere and be faithful. So how does he do that? Verse 26. He says, when the counselor comes, that's the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is in this one verse. When the counselor comes, the one I will send to you, Jesus from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And what's he say? He says, you will also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. There it is again, right? We love one another. We live a certain way and we testify. We share the message. The Holy Spirit comes and equips us so we can persevere through trial, Persevere through persecution. Persevere through suffering. Persevere through hatred. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives so that we can love one another. The Holy Spirit comes into our life so we can love those that hate us. Love those who persecute us. Love those who mock us. Love those who lie about us. The Holy Spirit comes into our life so that we can love as Christ loves. You're not going to love as Christ loves if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life. But God has set his seal on you. The Holy Spirit himself has come and he has set his seal in your life upon your salvation. And he equips you to live for him. I want to just, I'm coming to the close, but just hang with me. I want you to know, because th this may resonate with some of you in this room. People today want a cause to live for, especially young people. That's why people are rioting out in the streets. They, they're just looking for something, a cause. That's it. Looking for a cause. People are always searching for something. 
you know, what, what's a good cause? How can I help somebody? You know, just people want to be a part of something. People want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Serving the King, Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate cause. That, that's a cause that is true. Truly pure. Undefiled. It's unmatched. There is no other cause that can match the cause of Christ. Friends, the causes of this world that we might get wrapped up in or get all heavy in, there may be merit in them, okay? There may be merit in them. And, and, and okay, be a part of some of those. I, I just want to let you know something. The cause of Christ goes beyond this world. It's eternal. It's a cause that truly changes a person's life for eternity. God the Holy Spirit equips you for that. You see, when Jesus was placed in the tomb, the Roman authorities got the emperor's seal a signet ring and they get some wax and they put that signet upon that wax and they put a rope across the tomb the stone that had been rolled over that tomb and they put the seal there over that tomb and you know what that seal represented this is property of Caesar the Roman government Nobody mess with it. Nobody has authority over that. And he had placed his seal over that tomb. But what did Jesus say? He said, no, I've got all authority. And I've got all power. And he broke that seal. Because that's a man-made seal. And Jesus walked out of that tomb. He came out alive. You know what the Bible tells us? Friend, if you're a... If you today are a friend of Jesus because you've trusted in him you serve at the pleasure of the king your friend he says I've set my seal on you the Holy Spirit himself has come to live inside you to never leave you nor forsake you you say what authority does this church have to go out into this world, to go into the schoolhouse, to go into the courthouse, to go into the White House. Uh, what authority does this church have to go into somebody's home over here and knock on the door and to get on their property and to say, I've got something I want to tell you about? What authority do you have to stand before a group of peers at the place that you work and say, I've got some good news I want to share with you. What authority do you have to say, the government says I can't do it. The principal says I can't do it. The judge says I can't do it. The boss says I can't do it. Jesus says you can and he says, I have given you my authority. I have set my seal upon you. And my authority is above all authority. He says, you serve at the pleasure of the king who is your friend. Is Jesus your friend today? And then serve him like he's your friend. Serve him like it's a pleasure to serve the king. Because it is. You're here today, and you don't know Jesus as your friend and as your Savior. Then I want to invite you here in a moment when we stand and sing to come forward and say, Today, I want to trust in Jesus as my Savior, and He will save you today, and He'll set His seal upon you. Father, I thank you for your goodness. And Lord,
It truly is awesome that you are the king and yet you say we are your friends. And what a pleasure it is to serve you. Because you love us, because you command us, because you commission us, because you equip us. Lord, whatever's going on in our lives that we need to get right with you, help us to respond in the next few moments. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you would please stand to your feet. Listen, the reason we stand, the reason we sing, and the reason I stand here is so you can make a decision for Christ. If you need to make a decision, whatever that decision is, I want you to leave your seat as soon as we start singing. Come down here and speak with me. Please come as we sing. Jesus, thank you for your great love that you've shown us and that while we were yet sinners, you died on the cross for our sin. Lord, there truly is no greater love than your love. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to love one another, Christ, as you love us. We know we can't do that in our own strength, but we can do that through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that you have given to us. And Lord, you have commanded us not only to love one another in action, in our lifestyle, but you've called us to also share this good news message with people. Both love people in word and in deed. Holy Spirit, help us to do that. And be with us as we leave this place. Pray you bless those that have been here today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for being here today. We are dismissed.